Hello, YZW West scholars. Today we're going to take a look at the start of World War II, specifically the early timeline events that got World War II to start. When we think of World War II and its beginnings, we often think of the Axis powers and the very aggressive actions that they took to try and further their own goals. Sometimes I like to compare them with um, the Empire in Star Wars. They like to take over countries like they took over Tantooine or how they took over Hoth or when they decided to rebel against them they chose to go and destroy a planet. Now let's see if you agree with me that there can be a comparison made here. Let's go ahead and start. In 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Italy wanted to expand their empire in part due to poor economic conditions and felt that they could succeed against Ethiopia. Mussolini used a border conflict and lack of an apology as an excuse to invade Ethiopia. Mussolini felt this would show off the strength of the Italian military, help him show his worth and Italy's worth to fellow dictator Adolf Hitler, and give Italians a reason to support him. A modern Italian army faced a traditional Ethiopian army with a few with guns and spears. When Ethiopia appealed to the League of Nations, the League of Nations supported their claim, but they didn't have an army to respond. Instead, the League asked its members to give economic sanctions to Italy, including an arms embargo and a boycott. This wasn't enough to deter Italy. The Italians won Ethiopia in 1936 and made their first game. In 1935, the U.S. passed Neutrality Acts. The United States responded to growing aggression of Germany. For example, Germany was rearming themselves and completely ignoring the Treaty of Versailles. Japan, with her invasion of China, and Italy, by passing the Neutrality Act of 1935. The act made it illegal to sell to any one nation at war or in a civil war. In part, this is because many Americans believed in isolationism or staying out of European affairs. Some groups like America First felt that the U.S. needed to worry about issues inside the United States like the Depression and economic problems. Others worried that trade with warring nations would drag the United States into war like it had in World War I. On the other hand, interventionists argued that the U.S. needed to get involved in foreign affairs. In this cartoon, Dr. Seuss shows the neutrality acts will hold up aid that could help turn the tide of war. So you can see his position. On another note, you'll notice that I have a Girl Scouts uniform, and you might be wondering why that's here. That's because there were so many Americans against possibly going to war um, that the Girl Scouts changed the color of their uniform because it was too military-like. In July of 1937, Japan declared war on China. Japanese forces had been in Manchuria since 1931. They'd also expanded in Korea and Taiwan. In 1937, Japan launched a full-scale attack against China. Japan was motivated to create an empire to gain natural resources, help their economy grow, and prove that Japan was a military giant. Japan used total war in China, which included intense bombings and a big ground invasion. The Japanese were brutal in China. 300,000 civilians were massacred in Nanking, and the U.S. Embassy was overrun with Chinese seeking refuge. As this was not an official war yet, FDR supported aid for the Chinese and economic sanctions against Japan. The League of Nations responded by encouraging its members to stop trading with Japan, but many nations did not sanction Japan because of the Depression and their own economic woes. Interestingly enough, Japan chose to leave the League rather than put up with discussion of its actions or face possible sanctions. The League's inability to act in a way that was meaningful meant that for Hitler he was much like this kid in this candy store. With no one there to regulate payment or to regulate moderation, this kid could grab any um, jar of candy that he wanted and eat to his heart's content without fear of retribution or any sort of problem. That's what's going to bring us to the next piece in Hitler's plan. In 1938, 
Germany annexes Austria and took over a part of Czechoslovakia. Austria and Czechoslovakia included land that had been taken from Germany in the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. Hitler claimed that the Germans in Austria were being treated like second-class citizens and as a despised minority. So, he argued, they should be able to help them by joining Austria and Germany together in the Anschluss into one nation. German soldiers marched in, forced the Austrian leader to sign an agreement, and took Austria without force. In a similar way, Hitler took the Sudetenland located in Czechoslovakia. It was Germany's land before the Treaty of Versailles had been lost. It's the orange land you can see here. However, the end result was the same. Germany took over this area of Czechoslovakia as well. The only question now is, how will the League and the rest of the world respond to Germany's aggressive acts? September 1938, the Munich Pact. Leaders of Great Britain, France, Italy, and Germany met in Germany in Munich to discuss the Czech territories. When Czechoslovakia strongly protested, both France and Great Britain agreed to come to military aid of Czechoslovakia, but fears of war led them to support appeasement instead. In the appeasement policy, Germany was given what it wanted to avoid war. In other words, they were allowed to keep their possession of the Sudetenland. They hoped that this would keep the peace, but they also made Germany promise not to take any more territory. Germany agreed, and the Munich Pact became a law for these nations. Great Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain felt that he had kept peace in our time, but he did decide to rearm Great Britain, just in case. In March of 1939, Hitler broke the Munich Pact and took the rest of Czechoslovakia. Notice Dr. Seuss's political cartoon making fun of appeasement. Remember, one more lollipop and then you all go home. Notice the Nazi monster threatening the appeaser who is trying to offer them lollipops they might want. I think his position is clear. If not, let's look at this one. The Great U.S. Slideshow. And on this platform, the most amazing marble of his age, he lives, he talks, yet the guy has no guts. Dr. Seuss clearly isn't a fan of Chamberlain's. Chamberlain found himself in political trouble, had faced a vote of no confidence, and was replaced with Winston Churchill. August 1939, Nazi-Soviet Pact. In October of 1938, Germany demanded the return of Danzig from Poland. It had contained 90% Germans. Great Britain and France realized that appeasement had failed and declared their intent to support Poland if it were invaded. Both Germany and the Soviet Union wanted Poland, or parts of Poland, to regain lost territories from World War I. Germany also wanted the land for Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. Germany entered into a secret agreement with the Soviet Union to divide up Poland and not attack one another. Despite their misgivings and inability to get along, Germany and Russia were able to get along enough to divide up Poland, whether they wanted to or not. This was called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Now the question is, why might this be good for Germany? Let's take a look at these two political cartoons. Wonder how long the honeymoon will last? And over here we can see Little Goldilocks Riding Hood. I wouldn't want to come home to find Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia in my bed. Anyway, taking a look at both of these cartoons, and thinking about it, why might this be good for Germany? Germany doesn't have to face, face the large Soviet Red Army. And if they decide to take lands in the West or continue to take lands in the East, they don't have to worry about waging a possible two-front war. All of this basically leaves Poland like this sandwich that might be stuck in the middle of your backpack. At one point, it was fluffy and full. But the weight of the books coming in from both sides flattened the sandwich down until it kind of crumbled apart. On September 1st, 1939, Germany attacks Poland. Germany used a new technique of warfare called Blitzkrieg. This attack was fast-moving and quickly designed to break the enemy lines. 
first heavy bombing raids were conducted to try to gain air cover and control of the skies. Paratroopers were dropped in, um, as well as some forces, to break communication lines, munition lines, railroads, and air force. Then, tanks and ground forces would follow in a massive land invasion. Germany alone sent in two million soldiers. In the east, the Red Army also came in to take their portion of Poland, and Polish forces found themselves pressured in and soon swallowed up. Poland held out for one month, but couldn't deal with both armies. Now, Blitzkrieg was quite successful, and it became known as lightning warfare because of its speed and early successes. It's going to be a tactic that's used as Germany turns its eye west. So how and will Great Britain and France follow their promise to help Poland? They will. On September 3, 1939, World War II started when Britain and France declare war on Germany to support their promise to support Poland and because Germany had clearly broken the Munich Pact for a second time. World War II had officially started. During the fall and winter of 1940, both the Allies and Germany remained on the defensive, waiting for an attack. The French waited behind their defenses on the Maginot Line, which is the deep red line here. And notice that's their border with Germany. Um, the Maginot Line was a series of underground fortifications with barracks, wine cellars, and more that was designed to replace the trenches of World War I with more protection. You can see the outer view here. Um, see the cement parts? And here is a side view as well. Trolleys carried soldiers to combat muckers more than five miles long. Germans sat in their own Siegfried line. No fighting occurred, but they played cards, slept, and used planes to fly overhead and send out leaflets. Instead, instead they're going to find a new route of attack. After World War II broke out, President Roosevelt argued for the revision of trade laws and the Neutrality Acts to avoid the loss of merchant ships and allow U.S. to trade war goods with Great Britain while remaining neutral, the Cash and Carry Plan was passed and was a revision in the Neutrality Act of 1939. The U.S. could sell war goods to nations at war, but could not ship them. Nations at war had to pay for the goods up front, and loans were not allowed. This did actually favor Great Britain, which is one of the reasons why Roosevelt supported it. In June of 1940, fall of France. To avoid the defenses at the Maginot Line in France, Hitler attacked through the Netherlands in Belgium, swinging through the Maginot Line. The British in France raced to Belgium to attack. The Allied forces were trapped, and the Germans were able to push back all forces to the English Channel. The only port not controlled by the Germans was Dunkirk, so a mass evacuation of all Allied forces was completed, called Operation Dynamo. More than 800 volunteer ships of all sizes, from Navy ships to sailboats, headed to Dunkirk. They planned to evacuate 35,000 troops to Great Britain, but saved 338,000 troops. This is known as a Dunkirk miracle. However, the Allies lost a lot of goods, including 90,000 rifles, 7,000 tons of ammo, and 120,000 100, vehicles. With the Allies gone and the last forces in France officially surrendered, three weeks later on June 22nd, France had fallen. Hitler had the French sign the armistice in the same railway car that the Treaty of Versailles had been signed in. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Winston turned to Churchill. June 4, 1940, following the evacuation of British and French armies from Dunkirk. This brings us to the summer and fall of 1940 and the Battle of Britain. Germany chose not to invade Great Britain, although plans were readied in Operation Sea Lion. Hitler expected a British surrender after France fell. Part of the reason why Germany did not invade Great Britain was that they did not have effective landing craft or transport ships. German forces would be vulnerable to the British Air Force. Thus, the Germans need to defeat the British Royal Air Force, the RAF. The Battle of Britain was an attempt to do just that through bombing raids. When an accidental bombing of London occurred, the British were enraged and bombed Berlin in retaliation. 
Hitler responded by attacking London and planned to terrorize them into surrender. This became known as the Blitz. Although the RAF were outnumbered, they had radar and outflew the Germans. German, Germans had the disadvantage of having to return home to refuel. The RAF caused more losses for the Germans than the losses for the RAF. Germany lost 1,700 planes to British 900. Rallied by Churchill speeches, Great Britain did not surrender. Here you can see some of the images from the Battle of Britain. Here are some of those famous spitfires like my grandpa flew. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Winston Churchill, 1940, on the pilots of the RAF during the Battle of Britain and Blitz. This was the first time in the war that Germany had failed to reach an objective and kept Great Britain in the war. The only question was how to supply them.